Live for this week's Flippin' R show number 97, April 18th, eight days before the Avengers Endgame. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, got a, uh, everybody in the house tonight. We got Renikia, we got Adria. So over to you, Adria. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everyone. Glad that you can join us. As Ty stated, it's Thursday, April 18th, and you forgot to mention four days after the season one episode of the Game of Thrones. Of Game of Thrones. That's right. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never gotten into the Game of Thrones. Oh, oh really? <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> well, you better get You know, I might have to take a Saturday or Sunday off and next week this whole see all these seasons because a lot of people like it so yeah yes. that's gonna take you long <laughs> okay all i'm gonna say is you need to have you a, a, well, yeah it ain't gonna work you're gonna have to have a campsite in bed and just have some oh, really? <laughs> yeah, take a three meals bed. for all day <laughs> yeah. but it's worth it absolutely worth mm -hmm. it Hello, Miss Veronica Brightnex. I see you on Facebook. We are streaming live across YouTube, Facebook. Unfortunately, we're still down on Instagram, but we'll get that back up hopefully as soon as possible. This is show number 97. We're approaching 100 rapidly. Um, we thank you for joining us today. Make sure you go ahead and tag a friend, bring them along. We're going to answer your questions in regards to wholesaling real estate with little or no credit and any other questions that you might have. When you post your questions, make sure you tell us where you're from and give us a little background um, information so we can better suit the answer for you and your location. Without anything else, everybody say hello to Renikia. Renikia, tell them what's up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right, Ty. Well, I guess he already said hey. We're just going to jump right on into this thing. Um, if you don't know how this works, you post the questions. I read the questions, and they will answer the questions. The problem is, I can't find out where we are. Oh, you got it. Um, I got it. Okay. Yep. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Claren Ooh, Clarencia. Yo, Juan. Yo, Mystic Vanna, Frederica, Joshua, Steve, Morris, Charles Jenkins. Hey. Steve by Houses, Chantel, Summer Smiles, and Authentic Television, welcome. Mystic Wonder says, I keep hearing that you don't need money, but I watch other videos that say this isn't true. Which is it? Are we really lying to these people, Renikia? Lord, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is truly, you can structure these deals with absolutely putting no money into the project. It's all about strategy. Um, it's all about having the parties, um, bringing both parties to the table. So yes, of course, you know, um, there are, you know, you can do it 100% no money down. But sometimes there are marketing costs and, and things of that nature that you may incur that could be $100 to $200. But technically, yes, you can structure a wholesale deal and wholesale it a complete property with absolutely no money in that deal. Yeah, I think what people get confused about is that um, when we, we, you can literally do a deal where you have zero money invested. Mm -hmm. Now, it's harder to do deals that way, but it's possible. And, and now the actual deal itself, when you're talking about the seller, the buyer, and closing the transaction, yeah, that's literally no money. Now, if you're talking about, because if you're referring to what she was mentioning, the marketing cost mm -hmm. to try to make it easy to find deal, then yeah, you will spend a few hundred dollars or whatever. But the actual, to put a deal together itself, no, it mm -hmm. doesn't cost any money. You know, and so if you spend a few hundred dollars on marketing to generate leads, if you spend, we'll just say $300 to make $13,000, okay, mm -hmm. show me a business that you can do that in, in two weeks, three weeks right. or whatever. Right. But that's still when the actual deal itself didn't cost you anything, it just cost it, mm -hmm. cost it to generate the lead. Again, you can find deals where it doesn't cost you anything to find the lead. It's just harder mm -hmm. to do it that way because normally you're not going to be able to um, um, uh, uh, generate enough leads. For most people, they'll just give up. 
All right, now some gator people out there and all they do is just make phone calls. So it's just all time driven for them or whatever. And they haven't spent any money. They just make call of the wholesaler for sale by owner for rent properties. That just time is that doesn't cost them anything. Literally, it doesn't cost them, but it's, it's special people that can do it that way. So again, mm -hmm. yeah, you can literally do deals with no money, even on the marketing side. But even if you do spend a few hundred dollars or so on the marketing, the actual deal itself doesn't cost you anything to do it because the cash buyer is the one that's funding the deal. So yes, mm -hmm. it is true. It is true. I don't know. And I would like for you to reference who you're talking about so we could really break down what they're saying because they may not even know what they're talking about or they're not explaining the way we're explaining. So. And I want to just give you an everyday example. You know, this strategy is used in everyday life. So say, for instance, your brother, your sister wanted to sell their car for $5,000 and you knew someone that needed a car and they was willing to pay 6000 it didn't cost you any money to buy that property. I mean, buy that car because your brother has it. All you did is bring the buyer and the seller together and you made the money in between. It didn't cost you a dollar to bring that buyer and the seller together. And you just made a thousand dollars on that car. We do this in everyday life. Sometimes we just can't fathom the fact of buying our entire house with absolutely no money, but it's the strategy, just like the analogies I've just explained with the car. All right, there you have it. And yes, this can be done in California as well. That was her follow-up question. Still giving shout outs, Carlton Darville, Corey Griffin, Steve, Antoine, Yankee, and B. Marie, Angel, OAKZ, and Terrell. And last of all, Craig. Um, next question is from OAKZ. When you allow a buyer to come walk through a property you have on contract, how can you stop them from undercutting you and talking to the seller directly? Is there a protection? Your contract. And you need to make it clear with the buyer your position. It, it's that simple. You know, if, if it's a situation where the seller won't give you a uh, access to the property, um, then you have to make it clear with your buyer, you know, your role and their role <laughs> is that all questions about the property itself. Yeah, you can ask the seller, but as far as the money and the negotiations, that goes through me. It's, yeah. it's that simple. So then it's sometimes it's going to be a situation where you're not going to have buyers to act, act right, but you just have to handle it. All right. Um, just typing back to Mystic Wonder. I'm not sure if you've been with us uh, or is just starting out. And either way, it's great. We're here to help. Um, but don't think too too deep into this. You're making it complicated. She says, okay, got he or she. Okay, got that. Great. But can we really get paid for being the middleman? What do you huh. think Walmart, Target, the no, gas right. are? They're all the middlemen. They're not the making drop ship, the drop ships. Yes. Everyone middleman. America middlemans everything. <laughs> America doesn't produce anything but sells everything. Middlemaning is the is a strategy of business. Right, right. You tell me one thing that you buy. Well, and you probably can, but I, in general, how many things daily that you buy that somebody didn't buy from someone else? Right. Everything on Walmart shelf, Walmart doesn't, I may have the great value, but half of the products on their shelves is not made by Walmart, but they're selling it on their shelves. They're, they are the middlemen. And some of the stuff they slapping their name on. Baby. Exactly. So they're still the middlemen. It's, right. it's almost like owning every, controlling everything and own nothing, you know, which is a, it's a, it's a strategy in business. Own, control everything, but own nothing. Yes, Angel points out Amazon is making millions on being the middleman. Think about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so keeping it moving. Um, two, 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 two. Joshua Rojas wants to know, can you only wholesale distressed properties? How about already rehab properties for sale with an agent? <laughs> he asked him, can they wholesale it? Yes. So I guess he's wanting to know, I guess when they think wholesaling, they're thinking about the abandoned properties, dilapidated buildings and such like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. It can be something ready 
what, what do you call it? Key turn, ready to go. Um, turn. turn. <laughs> The key turn, turn key, same thing. Okay. Same thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, but I guess more importantly, he wants to know for can you wholesale properties that are with an agent? I think that's the key part that we can pull out of there. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be brand new. It doesn't have to be torn, you know, uh, dilapidated or distressed. But that key part is when you start dealing with an agent. That kind of mixes things up a bit, right? It does. I mean, honestly, you can wholesale anything. You know, so just you can wholesale whatever it is you want. If it's something at your house right now, you want to sell it. You can wholesale whatever it is that you want. It's when it gets down to when you start peeling back the layers, when you're dealing with real estate agents. So when a property is listed with a real estate agent and say, for instance, property listed at one hundred thousand dollars and you're trying to wholesale it at one twenty, a savvy investor is going to always Google the property address to do their desktop due diligence. And if they happen to Google that property address and it's listed with an agent for 20,000 or less than what you're asking, they're gonna cut you out every time. So that's the piece that really get kind of combobulated when you're dealing with um, real estate agents is the fact that it's public record. So if you're trying to wholesale it at a higher price, you probably nine times out of 10 is gonna get cut out because no one is gonna wanna buy it for higher than what someone really wanna sell it. So you got to take all of those things into consideration. Now, if you happen to see a property on MLS or from an agent and they're asking 100000 and you got them down to 70000 now you can sell it at 100000 because it's out there at 100000 It gives you that spread. So you got to be very mindful of that because you're going to look, you know, kind of weird or crazy to your end buyer. They happen to Google it and it's, it's out there at a lower price. All right. Um, Carlton on Facebook says he needs help with logistics. He's doing his first deal, um, but doesn't know if he should do a double closing or assignment contract. Where could I find an assignment contract? Use the same contract. The assignment contract. I personally don't use the assignment contract. It's too. It's too much. You know, and it brings up too much. Too many questions I don't want to answer. The Simon contract basically state, I pro- I got this property on the contract for fifty thousand, but I'm hope, but I'm going to assign it to you at sixty five thousand, and my assignment fee is fifteen thousand. So it puts you all your information on that piece of paper that you got to give to your end buyer. Now your end buyer is looking at this like, oh well, he really got it from sixty. He's trying to make fifteen thousand off me. He's not putting any money. That's when it begins to negotiate your fee. That's why I don't use an assignment contract. However, the one-page contract that Ty has, all these contracts has the assignment clause in it, which allows you to sign your contract to another party. And maybe Ty, if you want to add to that. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, ditto that, what, what she's saying. Um, I think, um, and um, it, it, it confuses people on sometimes how you and I go about it. We, we'll say we use two purchase and sales agreements, but we still get paid by an assignment fee or whatever. And uh, what you have to understand, sometimes um, you'll have an attorney or a title company. They'll want you to go that extra step sometimes to do an actual assignment uh, contract or whatever. Uh, and I've had them to do it where you just they just want you to sign it at closing, you know, between you and the buyer. Or whatever, but at the end of the day, most of them don't care if you if you break it down to them, even if they've never done a deal uh, with you before. And then if they don't do it, find somebody else that will. Um, but don't get confused because an actual assignment agreement is not used. An actual assignment transaction is still taking place. You just need to instruct them to do it. And and I guess we need to explain why we do it that way. Also, is that you? What well, I guess Marika sort of did explain, but. We don't want them to knowingly negotiate our assignment fee. Is exactly. what we're saying. Um, if you give them a price, they're negotiating a the price. We I we'll probably say this every week. You know, I may have it under contract for a dollar, the property with the seller, you know, but he negotiated a price that works for him. And whatever I make in above the contract that I have with the seller is what I make, and that's my assignment fee. But we do it for the reason that we want them to negotiate a price that works for them, not knowingly negotiating our assignment fee. They're negotiating, but they don't know how much we're making. And they, they can eventually find out, but they uh, 
and they're not knowing it up front. I guess that's what I'm saying. All right. I have a question from JB, and I want every listener, subscriber, anyone entertaining the idea of beginning their wholesale journey to listen, because this is for you. I'm speaking it into existence. JB wants to know, what do you tell the banks you do when you go to open a business account? Each and every one of you are real estate investors. That's it. That's what you are. You are. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't have to get in. The, the, nothing else everybody everybody right. know what that is. You don't have to get into what form of real estate investing you're doing. You're just a real estate investor. And, and, and the paperwork that you fill out, because you're going to have to have a business license or whatever, it's going to say that. You know, it, you're going to get to that point. It's just... I'm, I buy and sell real estate. That's it. Who doesn't understand that? You don't have to get into no more detail than that. So that's what you all are today. We are all real estate. Claim it. Yeah, that's it. And that goes for when you're talking to a seller, you're a real estate investor. When you're talking to a buyer, you also are a real estate investor. I mean, just, just keep it simple, guys. That's what you are. Yeah. Um, Tamiko Howard, welcome. She wants to know, can you wholesale a property in a different state um, than what you live in? Yeah, you can wholesale properties all over the country. Uh, one of my main buyers was from Israel, you know, China. Um, you know, so it, it doesn't matter where you are. It's just it, what matters is um, you have the boots on the ground um, and making sure that you are structuring your deal correctly with the right numbers. The key is when you're not in your backyard, you have to heavily rely on someone else to give you accurate numbers and accurate information. Um, so, yes, you can wholesale anywhere. However, your success is probably going to rely heavily on your team that you have on the ground. Okay. Um, and tying into that, B. Marie says, if it's a virtual deal, do the papers go through the title company in the seller state or where you are? Um, the property will be closed with an attorney in the state where the property sits. The attorney that the attorney that draws up the closing documents is going to be the attorney within the area where the property is. Now, if the buyer is our sellers in another state that attorney is going to draw up the documents he's going to email the closing documents to them they're going to they're going to do to sign with a wet signature blue ink and they're going to overnight that full closing doc package back to the closing attorney so that called a out-of-state closing and they have to go get it notarized somewhere where they live um they can get it notarized anywhere there's not to be an attorney that goes to the bank the, the docs just have to be notarized, um, and then they will overnight those with the wet signature and send a scan copy that same day back to the attorney. All right, there you have it. It's Mr. Everything. Welcome joining us for the first time. Um, hopefully, you're getting some really good information from this webinar. Um, Toya Tackles Deals wants to know. How many times would you follow up with a seller that asked you to call them in two weeks but has not answered? Keep calling. Keep calling. I mean, you know, follow up as 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 much as you think. I mean, sometimes if they tell you to call back, I mean, obviously they, they're okay with you calling them back and they're still somewhat interested in some of the property. Um, it's a numbers game. I wouldn't put all my apples in the basket and wait two weeks. Um, on them to call me or answer the phone. I'll keep moving. Keep, continue to move your feet. And, and you know, in two weeks, call them back. Two weeks. And, and probably just go two week increments and give them a call. If he give you an email address, send them an email and say, hey, just still interested. And kind of up to you when you want to stop making those calls if, if you think they're not interested anymore. Um, yeah. All right. What's up, Luan? We're doing great. He says hello. Um, Craig, hand clap for Mr. Craig, who's got his first deal under contract. He closes next month. Good luck to you. And mm -hmm. Earl wants to know, how do you assign a contract to another buyer without the seller knowing? I think we kind of, did you kind of already went over that? Yeah. yeah. Sure. That's what wholesaling is. Yeah. It's the whole That's premise the whole of wholesaling. Yeah. Um, you, just, you just get your buyer to sign a contract. 
as you know, which pretty pretty much signing your original seller's contract to your invite. Okay. Danny, the seller would never know. Danny So Called Life says she's been putting this off for two years now. Ooh. Shaking my head. Yep, we shaking our head at you too, Danny. Mm. <laughs> she says it mm. keeps calling her back. She's going to invest back into herself this time. I know that's mm. right. Go mm. ahead, real estate investor. Mm. You've already spoken that into your mm. life. Um, let's see here. Freddie Ray from PNW. I ain't even going to like I know what that is. Um, let's see here. Cadet says, I'm just starting a rookie, if you will. What do I do with the contract after I get it signed? Now, we're speaking of just getting, a, uh, I guess, the house under contract with the seller. What do you do with it? Hold on to it? Or what, what? I guess that's what he's wanting to know. Okay. So when you get the property under contract with the seller, which is your AB contract, your first contract, and within that contract, you have a due diligence period. Um, it could be three days, it could be five days, it could be seven, it could be 30 days. It's really whatever you negotiate with the with the seller. During that due diligence period is really your time frame to go and secure it in buyer, um, um, to go and secure it in buyer. So you take that due diligence period and you secure it in buyer. When you secure that in buyer, you have that in buyer to put up um, um, earnest money or give them a very short due diligence period because your due di their due diligence period has to still align with your original due diligence period. So if you have three days left on this due diligence, then you, you know, offer this 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 buyer two days, just in case they don't come to the table and execute the contract. You have a day left to go out there and try to find a new buyer or something of that nature. So you're going to secure the, the new contract, put the due diligence in, in there, also put the earnest money. So when that end buyer sign off on that contract, that end buyer must put up earnest money. That earnest money will go to the original seller, not necessarily to the original seller. I like to send my earnest money to the attorney, but that's how you create that no money down. So you may owe the seller $1,000 earnest money at the end of your due diligence period. However, you have a buyer over here who who's willing to purchase the property from you and put up $1,000 earnest money. So you take that thousand dollars to come a wash, take it and you give it to the seller. You just end up putting that property on the contract with absolutely no money out your pocket because the end buyer paid for everything. And then once the end buyer say, yes, I like it. The due diligence period is up. I like it. You want to send both of those contracts to your attorney and allow your attorney to take it from there. All right, guys, if you haven't joined our How to Wholesale Real Estate um, with the Flipman Facebook group, please do so. Um, there's over 30,000, I think, members in that group. Um, some seasoned, some newbies, but questions asked all the time. And I will say at least 60% of the time, you'll get a pretty accurate answer. Um, one of the admins of that group is Miss Crystal Davis. She's a CPA, but she also is a real estate investor. Her and her husband close about three to five deals a month. I mentioned that because she is ever learning. If you don't know about Ty, he's always finding out and learning something new. I'm sure Renika can say the well, but she has a question today as well. It is what is. Oh, before before you ask her question, um, uh, y'all have probably noticed that Instagram is no uh -huh. more. And, uh, was, you know, but anyway, um, so the new Instagram currently have five followers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you lost uh, the account? Yeah, yeah, long story. Uh, went from 21,000 to five followers. So if you want to find me on Instagram, I'll start posting new uh, info. Um, it's Flipman IG. So it's just Flipman IG. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, we're working on the other. Yeah, well, it's, I've, I've been told, I've been advised by others, don't just just try to go over the person's head that I've been uh, dealing with, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, all that crazy stuff on Instagram, they delete my account. I'm wow. just I'm amazed, man. <laughs> just, uh, wow. Oh, boy. Just, That's uh, scary. Get some neck rolling and some sister snapping. Okay, man, all that neck rolling is on Instagram. Right. All that ignorant stuff is on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, wow. Wow. You get it mm. Okay. Are you ready now? Yeah. Yeah. I see people already uh, hooking up on Instagram. So thanks you know, for everybody that signed up right now. So 
Let's get back to twenty thousand tonight. <laughs> we will. <laughs> the way that Facebook went up, you it won't be a problem. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so Crystal's question is: What is a good way to address blight tickets that came back on the title work if they are looking for a certain amount for selling their property? Um, how do you explain it to the owner that you blight need tickets. to blight? What is that? Uh, you mean liens? I guess. I yeah, know. it must be lean. Must be lean. How do you explain to the owner that you need to clear the title first before you can proceed to the closing table? Well, technically, well, well yeah, you, well, you got to clear before. Um, mm -hmm. What? What? I guess you need to answer. Or is, is the seller having an issue? They don't understand that those that those liens will be well. Normally, no, no, a no, blight no. ticket is when you have must be a mold thing. Oh, oh okay. It's, so it's like it's um the, it won't pass uh, the city's inspection to sell it, I guess, of some sort. Um, mm -hmm. Some cities may be you like buy properties with mold. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Unless you, just, they, you know, you, when you sell it, you have to disclose that it has. If you know that it has. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> She may need to be a little bit more clear. It may be a local thing there that they might not allow transactions to happen until that's, you know, um, corrected, corrected. Uh, of some sort. Mm -hmm. You know, it may be a local thing. You know, it just may be a local mm -hmm. ordinance or something on real estate transactions. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I guess the owner should know that. You know what she was saying, place. Uh, but they don't know sometimes. You know, sometimes. Minus the light ticket, the owner knows that everyone should know that you have to clear title before you purchase a property if you're going through a, a closing attorney. Now, if you just quit claim, that's how you get a lot of liens and a lot of everything. Someone just quit claim you onto a property. Now you 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 are quit claim onto the liens as well. But when you go through an attorney or a closing attorney or a title company, they must clear title before they can convey a title to a new owner. No attorney can truly sell a property if the title is not 100% cleared because usually the title insurance must, um, um, usually the title insurance require to see a clean title before they insure the title. So that's just protocol standard for yeah for the seller to to understand that they must clear title before for you can sell the property. So no buyer. Okay, Jules, Jules, I see you on YouTube. I agree. We ain't even gonna say that. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Sean Jackson said, "Really? What's up, fam? Adrian, where you been? I was worried you got to send out a memo next time you on leave like that. First of all." <laughs> Oh, I got the side. Your present was missed last week. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, you're right. Right, my bad. Um, let's see here. Joe Louise, Ty, this is for you. Could you please shed some light on your one on one coaching, please? I'm going to invest in your training. So I'd love some feedback on your coaching system or how it would work for us. Please tell him how he can get in contact with you. <laughs> Thanks for my brother. Uh, chatting in to set that softball up for me. But anyway, uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in the uh, coaching and stuff that I offer in the courses, but in a nutshell, what it is, is uh, you get two courses on wholesaling houses and apartment buildings and me personally coaching you through deals. Now, I won't quote a price here because it'll change. It's been at the same price for a couple of years now. So we got this thing called inflation. So it will rise. <laughs> My, as my bills rise and folks that I know bills rise. So um, anyway, so uh, just, just all you got to do is just always just text or call me and I'll be happy to break it down to you. Um, I know I'm going to be a little uh, broad here, but um, I try not to just hammer you all with that kind of stuff, even though, you know, it's available. So, um, so anyway, just, just hit me on that. You know, the reason I put my number out there. So, uh, and speaking of apartments, and I'll just put it out here, but I never know what other people know. Um, I, um, well, in a nutshell, uh, if, if you know of any off-market property, my definition of off-market means if I can Google the address 
and it's not anywhere online for sale, I consider that off market, right? Okay. So normally the first couple of pages, if it's not there for sale, then boom. But um, I got this um, connect with a, uh, a hedge fund that needs to buy uh, multifamily 125 uh, units or more. Um, I've never done a deal with them. I'm just, you know, they reached out to me. So, um, uh, well, one of their representatives re reached out to me. And, um, but 125 units or more, it can be a C plus, it can be a C property up to a B and um, a minimum spend of 2 million um, anywhere in the country. So um, if, if, if someone sends me over, don't, don't send me over anything where it has a plus three NC, NC, ND, I'm not going to be interested. Cause that means in most cases, they so far away from the owner, the decision maker, you wait for your time. And I, know not, I may be wrong on some of those, but I, I, I spent a whole year chasing those once. Yeah, and if that, that comes over to me, it's being ignored. Mm -hmm. I, we need to be talking to either the owner or the owner's broker. No mm -hmm. seller reps, none of that stuff. So it, I hope, do I need to repeat that? If not, replay this mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, NCND needs to be signed. <laughs> Let me tell you about that. All right. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be that uh, screw, uh, what's the word? I don't know. I don't know what uh, <laughs> I'm going to be that shady. That's not going to stop me from going around you. Because I can just mm -hmm. put somebody in place that you don't know that I know. Right? Mm -hmm. if, if that was the case. It really it don't mean anything if I'm going to be like that. I understand why they send it, but I'm just letting you know that I'm not going to be interested. And I may be missing out. I just know I wasted a lot of time. It said, if it says plus three <laughs> or plus whatever, and the NC, I'm it's being ignored off the top. Been there, done that, right? Um, what about um, a duplex park? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have this. Location is about forty duplexes. So it's not that? hard, but it's you know it's like a place. I got Couple rows of duplexes. It's like a whole subdivision of duplexes. Yeah, exactly. A whole subdivision of duplexes. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about it. yeah, yeah. That's okay. But what was the question? Oh, that was I did answer the question. You did answer the question, but April is like me. She wants to know what are the different classes of properties. For example, C class properties and D class properties. What's what's the difference? That's a good question. That's a very good question. And the best way I can explain it, some people, they, they go about it a couple of different ways. Sometimes they just simply on the year, the years that they're built, but it also depends on the area. So it's like a combination of things. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, well, let me, this is the best way I can explain it. Okay, wherever you live, especially if you live in a large city, right? You know the A side of town, quite quote unquote the A side of town, where the house is going rich, to be very expensive. The rich so the, of town. Yeah, so the apartments are going to be very expensive also. Those are the A's, A apartments, right? Where the rents are at their highest. And then you know where the D side of town, right? The side you don't go to. The side where, the, where, where we see on the news every night. I'm not just yeah. saying facts here. Where the, yeah. I can't control what the news put on, but you know what I'm talking about. The consistent be on the news every night. That's the D side of town. So we're not talking about the A, we're not talking about the D. So that C, which is the next level up from the D, you know, if you're in your market, and then you know the, the next level below the A. So there you go. That's the best way I can explain it. Uh, where just, uh, just a layman, somebody don't know anything about real estate. Uh, what's your definition? What, what's your understanding? What's the A, B, C, and D? I would have said the same thing. And it, it, it definitely boils down to the property and the area, because you can have a you can have a a property in a C area, you know. So it, it, it's really um, it boils down to crime, um, um, curb appeal, um, um, the different curb appeal, you know, the area. All of that is taken into consideration. If it's A, where the most expensive in the rich side of of town is, then you have the B, which is you know, probably your upper middle class area that, you know, rents are not as high, um, you know, but it's not a C. Then you have your C area. It could be the area that is kind of on the come up, um, but it still has a lot of dilapidated. Um, the curb appeal is not necessarily there in that area or the property. Um, the curb appeal is not there. And it is just a hood 
point blank period. Um, so that's kind of how you classify that. Mm -hmm. The Hustables lived in the A, the Jefferson <laughs> lived in the B, and uh, oh, hey, lived in the A. And that's why they live in New York. Okay, okay well, this is okay. Adrian. Okay, well, the Fresh Prince lived in A and the Jeffersons lived in the B. Is that better? No, no, they still lived in the A in New York. In a <laughs> they, do. they buy apartments. Well, who live in the D? Who live in the D? Good times, Florida and Graves. Florida and James lived in D. And Sanford and Son lived in D. Sanford and Son lived in D. They lived in D. They were no else. <laughs> Look at this empire. <laughs> no, they lived in G. It is. The people does not make it. <laughs> oh, they lived. Oh, the Jefferson, that was an A. That's A. Oh, that's A. I guess so. Um, uh, people, that's the A. That's the baby. I guess this. they lived in the A. But, okay, that's what the people in New York. I guess we're going to be I'm no, this is, well, who lived in the sea? We ain't said nobody that lived in the sea. Um, let me, right. let me see. Um, right, who lives in the sea? Uh, probably, um, probably, um, uh, Martin and what's his name? Ah, somebody just said Carmine just said Martin was a sea. Yeah. Uh, Martin Lawrence and Jimmy Martin was a sea. Okay. All right. Fine. Good lady. Jefferson being A with Phil and Bel Air. Yeah, how do you know? That's that's I feel a good analogy. <laughs> oh, everybody's eyes with you. Jefferson's lived in the A. They had a doorman. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Well, right. Fresh Prince oh, definitely was in the A. Had, uh, how many locations in it? Um, five. Five locations. Yeah, five locations. A cash cleaning business like that. A cleaners. It was a wash. It was a laundry. Oh, <laughs> no, definitely cleaners. I was being funny. Oh, 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 break you, man. <laughs> Now. Oh wow! Okay, we we gonna move on up and move along. <laughs> I did that. Zamia mm -hmm. wants to know. Uh, she says, "I'm about to go into a contract, her first one, and there are five siblings." Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, it gets better. Mm -hmm. There are five siblings in different cities and states. Mm -hmm. What is the best? method for getting them all to sign well you got to well you got well, to start agree well well first thing we're assuming all of them agreeing on the price right <laughs> if that's the case and that and that's it now that they, they didn't have any more whoever their parents were or whatever parent left them the property there are no more kids so we're assuming the heir stuff is already taken care of maybe there's a will and there's an executor so we're assuming that much right Okay, so if that's the case and they're all agreeing on the price, and then we're hoping that all of them have email. If not, the ones that don't, you may have to, you know, overnight them something and send it back to get the contracts. Uh, really, let me just say this. Really, um, technically, you don't have to get all of them to sign the actual purchase and sales agreement. You know, in reality, sure. they, just, they just need to show up at the close. They just need to be closable. No, they don't have to come to the closing. They just have to, <laughs> you, just like to you just have to confirm that they're going to allow you to close and they're going to do, they're going to be in position where they can either be emailed and or overnighted the, the, the necessary documents to sign. So whoever you're dealing with, whatever brother or sister you may be dealing with multiples, you just need to make sure that they are handling and everybody's on the same page. You don't have to actually speak to all of them, right? But mm -hmm. you need to make sure that that person that you're dealing with is the man or the woman that, that's making sure everybody's on the same page or whatever. So what you got, baby? But when it comes to that closing, everybody has to sign off on those closing docs. Oh, yeah. Everybody. They don't have to come in. They can be all in different states. You just have out-of-state closing, um, you know, with other parties. But... When it comes to those closing docs, everybody on that deed or has control of that property um, or that estate must must sign off on the closing docs. All right. She said they all agree, so she's one step ahead. That's that's great. Oh, yeah, let us know what happened. Paul Viola, you must have joined us um, kind of late. He says, what's going on here? We were explaining the difference between the 
property zones A, B, C, and D and using popular uh, late 70s, early 80s sitcom TV shows to do so. That's, that's what we were doing. And no, Sanford and Son did not own an antique shop. It was junk. Don't be sad. Oh, oh really? Oh, sir. And Yankee is right. Thank you. Jefferson's were a B because how did they live next door to Archie Bunker? Oh, they did live next door to Archie Bunker. So, yo, see, now, wow. I think his property so, was. They, they moved. It says, <laughs> y'all moved right I from the Harvard Stone. Don't they I move? They went when the Jeffersons, but they lived in the B before they lived in the Oh, that may have been a C where Bart Archer was living. Might have been a D. They lived in you the know, They moved. They moved up. Yeah, they moved. property looked like a junkyard, so oh. I would say the property was a C. Before, before oh, up. what is he talking about? They, they lived in the C. Besides oh, we're talking about on the show where they lived. There. That was Bunker Show. We talking about the Jeffersons. They lived in a penthouse oh. with a doorman. Come on now. Who the Jeff? Oh, the, uh, Sam, I'm thinking Sanford and Son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm with you when you write. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson, <laughs> I'm sorry. Westside Detroit. Two closings in the last week. Good job. I haven't seen Wait you now. in a minute. Yes, what's up? Love it. Congratulations. <laughs> Dcash Production says, do all tax assessors give you a copy of the probate property list for free? My county charged me $250. What? Wow. It's, it's probably all... working online. Yeah, it's just going to be different from county to county. It's, it's going to be different, man. Uh, it's going to be oh, wow. It won't be nothing. You just got to go down there and pull it yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You probably pay mm -hmm. for whatever, but you know, the printing, or if you write it down on the paper, they're not going to charge it. You tell you, hey, go in there, this is the log in, and how you get in, and boom. It, it's just going right. to differ. It, it's just going to differ. That's why you need to go to flipprobase.com. Boom. Mm -hmm. Google that. YouTube that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> boom. Uh, I can't with you right now. Uh, <laughs> Darius Hoosman wants to know, what outsourcing tool do you use for skip tracing? <laughs> Actually, I'm going down this list. Oh, she ready. Y'all better get your pen and paper. I ask this pretty much weekly on right. <clears throat> for, for skip tracing. So she's about to give y'all a rundown on some pretty popular some oh, yeah. Why, why, sites. Yeah, while Renique, you're pulling that up, don't forget to hit me up. I see people have already started doing it on Instagram. I got deleted, deactivated. So the new uh, Flipman uh, Instagram user is uh, Flipman IG. So you know what that means, Flipman Instagram. So Flipman IG. Somebody has Flipman. If you got it out there, you want to sell it to them, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, okay, we're ready for that list. Yep, I'm ready. So these are some of the most popular skip tracing. Um, it varies by uh, price. Um, so whatever you can afford, um, that's what you do. You have TLO, TLO, Prospect Now, Lessis Nexus, which is the most expensive and probably has the most accurate is what like bill collectors and people like that use. But they, they, it's very expensive and kind of hard to get if you don't have an a office where they can come and check. Um, Been Verified, Locate Plus, is one I use a lot. Um, it's about $79 a month. It's pretty accurate. Um, so that's some of the top skip tracing services. All right. Um, let's see here. Uber guy just landed a contract in Macon, Georgia, but it's been very hard to find a buyer via the internet. What is another way <laughs> to find buyers in an unproper, <laughs> I love it, in an unproper area? Maybe Macon, Georgia. That's 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 I'm from that area. So when when you're trying to and it's it's probably it's not as hot and popping like Atlanta, uh, where everybody wholesaling, so it's like normal. Um, so you you want to create a wave down there. You want to um, um, start putting out bandit signs and things of that nature to um, find cash buyers. So just how we buy houses. Um, or whatever, um, or, or we sell houses, or whatever the case may be. So you want to create some type of campaign down there. I'm not for sure if they have weird groups and things of that nature, 
Um, but if they do, if they don't, you create it and start marketing and, and start, you know, people start coming to you. But you want to find buyers in that area um, because being in Atlanta, no one wants to invest in, in making, to be honest. So there's not a lot of investors who want to invest in making even here. So to me, you almost have to find um, people that's already lived in the middle Georgia area who see the vision down there and wants to invest in that area down there. So you got to do a, just like we do a seller, um, I mean, find houses campaign. You want to do a campaign to find buyers, which is the same methods. It's just your wording is different. Instead of we, we buy houses, we sell houses um, or something of that nature. Dirt cheap houses for sale. Dirt, yeah. Do your campaigns, put your bandit signs out. And 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 the more rich predominant area down <laughs> and make it, which is a it's a side, you know, put it over there and decide where the money is. Um, because they're the ones probably gonna be your cash buyers. Um, quick question. This goes back to Demia, and she had the question about the siblings. She wanted to know, does it have to be the same? piece of paper that they all sign or can they each sign an individual one or does that one contract has to float from each one so no, the signatures are that's why i said the purchase and sales agreement you really don't have to get one person to sign it uh technically you probably want to get them all but i'm just letting you know mm -hmm. you just need to get everything in motion because at the end of the day you're gonna have mm -hmm. them all sign the purchase and sales agreement it won't matter that they all don't sign the closing documents it's the mm -hmm. sale property so just get it in motion and then work it from there. Just one person would do. Because I would definitely, um, you know, make sure you have, you feel, if you do verbal from the other parties, make sure you feel good about that because, um, um, because um, the last thing you want to do is do all that work, get your empire in place, and then you get to the closing table and one of the siblings is fighting against it and, and, and whatever the case may be. So, Make sure you know for a fact that everybody's on board because um, you don't want to do all that work and get to the closing table and can't sell it because one of the siblings has been starving or something. All right. Paul um, has a pretty good question. I don't think I've seen this one. Um, he's on Facebook. What kind of timber is valuable when you inquire land, when you acquire land? So if you're doing a land deal, <laughs> what type of timber should you be looking for? Um, <laughs> I just know very little about it. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. I've uh, added that to my uh, repertoire. repertoire is um, I met a seller that actually turned me on to uh, some things and he's, he will help me with it or whatever. But uh, pine, uh, trees, red oak, white oak, uh, those are the normal three. And you can do additional research on that as far as what they cost. Uh, what you should look for is the uh, diameter, meaning how round the uh, trees are or whatever, um, how tall they should be, all of that. And then it'll just vary from there. Uh, uh, how many trees, um, you can have bugs that could ruin uh, some timber or whatever. So there, there are several factors that go into it. But there, there are quite a few videos on YouTube, you know, explaining stuff about timber also. So it's, it's a totally different animal. Uh, but generally speaking, you got to get a problem. Ideally, the way he approached it, it makes sense to me. Uh, if you buy land for the timber, you generally want the timber to at least pay for the land because you can always replant. You know, it's just an investment. Uh, seven, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years from now, you got a whole new batch of timber that you can, that you can um, cut or whatever, but the land is paid for. So now that's, all profit you know outside of your taxes on it so um but just to find out the research of different type of trees you know there's tons of videos on youtube that explain so okay thank you for answering that um Renika, if you still have that list out i have about two or three unable i'm actually unable to type it out or i would can you shoot that list one more time okay guys here it is i'll say it one more time t l o Prospect Now, Lexus Nexus, Ben Verified, and Locate Plus. There's more out there, but those are the top ones I have used and seen. 
All right. Um, you're welcome. We are true to being here on Thursdays. As Royal says, hello, guys. Thanks for being so faithful on Thursday. And I ain't faithful, but I is. Guys, we're <laughs> here, here to put this information out there for you. There's no, no reason, no excuse that you can't begin your wholesaling career and investing in real estate. And if you're ready to take it to the next game, uh, we have Ms. Renikia here who can provide services that you can stack on top of wholesaling. A lot of you have been asking, who is she? Who is she? What's her name? Her name is Renikia. I just said it like a thousand <laughs> times. Are you not listening? But I think you explain to the good they, people. They got to be first time here. Huh? They got to be first time here. I don't think so. I've still said it like five times. No, I'm saying they have to be the first time they're here if they ask her, who is she? Um, right. I don't know. My voice. They can't see you, though. They, they might say, I'm Siri. I'm Siri. Oh. I didn't know. Uh, Alexa. Oh, Siri. Oh, Alexa. Oh, Alexa. Oh, Alexa. Alexa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Ms. Renikia, tell the people mm. what services your company um, I offers. How to do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, um, I am Renikia Williams, the founder and CEO of Orchard Key Financials. And our goal is to help you find and put the um, creative financing around you and your investments. Um, if it's business, if it's, you know, um, um, you know, needing some extra um, cash to really put a marketing campaign out there. If you're looking to do your first fix and flip, our focus is to get you the resources and the capital um, and creative financing you need in order to implement your investment strategies to build generational wealth. Now, if you want to take advantage of, you know, leveraging your credit, one of our flagship um, services is that we help you leverage your credit to receive up to $150,000 of unsecured credit in order to um, use that money um, to purchase um, and do a, do a fix and flip. So if you want to take advantage of leveraging your credit to receive up to $150,000, you must have a 680 credit score or higher. However, we do have um, mechanisms in place if you're not quite there to get you there. Um, if you want to take advantage of that, go to fundmynextdeal.com um, to take advantage of our financing option. And um, as well, you see all of my um, social media handles um, that I'm pretty active on. I'm more active probably on Instagram than I am on Facebook. Um, and then my email address if you have any questions, um, um, any quick questions that you may have. All right, so her contact information is there on the screen for Miss Angel and Tamikia. I hope you see that there. Um, get in contact with her. Just keep in mind that she has a staff that will get back to you within 24 to 48 hours of you emailing. Um, but at the end of the day, even though she's accessible here every Thursday, it's still a business that she's running in, but she'll get back to you. It's well worth the wait. Um, let's see here. I have a, is it a deal question? I don't think we've had one of those in a minute. So get out the calculator, calculaki, and let's see what we got here. Um, only thing is guy, you didn't tell me how much you had it under contract, but we'll go with what you have here. Ooh, and I said all that, not to even have a damn long question. Um, well, I think I've lost it. I'm going to read a question until I can find that. Um, Rose Gold wants to know, can you still check the A-class houses like $399, $600, and even the million-dollar houses? Like if you find a house of that price with no real estate company, can you still profit if you have a buyer too? I think she's maybe asking, can you wholesale high-dollar homes? Of course, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can wholesale anything as long as the value is there to be wholesaled. Okay, and don't be afraid of those uh, high dollar houses, guys. I mean, don't let them scare you off. It may require a little bit more um, work but or effort, but it most definitely can be done. Um, let's see here. What formula, what flip formula do you use as in calculations? So maybe she's talking about the 70% rule. Uh, so um, flip formula. So this is the flip formula. It works every time. It's a, you know, pretty much a standard. Um, is what um, lenders kind of the way the lenders calculate 
um, if you've uh, been approved or not for your project. So what you want to do is simple math, please write this down as a very simple formula. <laughs> you want to multiply your after repair value um, or your, your average comp you want to, uh, which is your ARV, you want to multiply your after repair value times 70%. That answer will be your all-in cost. So basically, the after repair value times 70% is the total loan amount a lender will lend, including your purchase and your rehab. So your purchase and rehab must fit within 70% our ARV. If it's over, you'll get denied or they'll tell you, you know, what you need to do to tweak it in order for you to get approved. But that's pretty much standard, you know, 70 percent of ARV. And that's your all in cost. And that's the total amount a lender will be able to will be willing to lend on your project. OK, and that will determine if you have a deal or not. If, if when you add up your purchase and your rehab and it's more than that 70 percent. Don't make it fit. It's too much, too many properties out here, too many deals out here uh, for you to try to make something make sense. If it doesn't make make sense, it doesn't make sense. You know, so don't try to make it make sense if it can't make sense. Just keep moving to the next one because if you try to finance a property over that 70%, it's not worth it. It's, it's cutting into your profit margin. You have taxes, realtor fees, and all these fees on the back end. You know, three, four, five months up, to, you know, up to in, in this renovation, and and you you may very very little. It's not worth it. So it protects you, I mean, and, um, as the borrower, and it also protects the lender. So seventy percent is just the threshold. It's the in, industry standard on how to calculate if you are if your deal makes sense or not. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I cannot scroll back up to the top of YouTube. I refreshed my screen and it blocked out some chat. So we will catch a, is it a deal question later, but I do have a subscriber who's asked how much of a deposit do you ask from a buyer on a $350,000 commercial building? Say how much, how much, how much uh, earnest money? Yes. On a $350,000 building? Yes. Uh, I would a minimum of five grand. Um, mm -hmm. I'm probably but a minimum of five. Minimum. Yeah. $2,500 to $5,000 Okay. And twenty five dollars maybe too low. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see here. Y'all are selfless with the knowledge. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Angel says, I'm going to be late for work, but it's okay. I'll be working for myself soon. But you got to clock in to somebody else. Clock in. Clean it. I, I, I claim that with you, Angel, but don't be late now. Um, Shaq, you're a little late. I said, what's up to you like almost an hour ago? Some of us are going to be old. Mm -hmm. What's up? Nope. Um, Chris mm -hmm. says hello. And let's see here. Anyone that's in the messages that are saying they're scared to start or they want to start, today is the day. Go ahead and begin now. Um, I was still in the one question that I, I cannot find. It. I'm, I'm good. Okay, Paul Viola says, I think land is the best way to start wholesaling to get your feet wet because the owners are so willing to say, here you go, where do I sign? And boom, wholesale it to a developer. What you think about that? Not the easiest said, and it's easier said than done. Right. Okay. right. Takes a little bit more into it, but I, I get mm -hmm. it. I start something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But houses are just as easy, though. Yeah. Yeah. Easier to evaluate. Yeah, easier to evaluate. Uh, land, sometimes it's hard to come up with a real number for land because you don't have anything to compare it to. Okay, so I've been driving for dollars. <laughs> I am so dumb with this dude. Okay, I've been driving for dollars and finding a lot of vacant houses. Should I skip trace them next? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> So basically, you want to call, they contact the um, homeowners who owns the property and see if they want to sell. Yeah. Very simple. And let them know that you're a real estate investor and um, you, you're very interested in the neighborhood that their property sits in. And you actually have purchased other properties in this neighborhood and looking to purchase more. Um, and that's pretty much setting the stage on a lot of times 
you know, um, people who have been into neighborhoods for a long time, they know a lot of people in their neighborhoods. So setting that stage and, you know, asking, hey, do you know anyone else that's trying to sell? You know, could you pass that information along? But just give them a call, build some rapport, um, a little rapport and um, ask them if they are in the in if they want to sell their property. Tell them you are an investor in the area looking to purchase. Okay, um, let's see here. Dwayne Jones wants to know, how does a JV agreement work? How do you put under contract a deal from another wholesaler? And that's a really good question. I mean, it, it's multiple ways to do it. Um, it's multiple ways to do it. You as the wholesaler can come together and be honest and put on the table, hey, I'm a wholesaler in it. You wholesaling it, so let's just put our, our middle man together in the middle and we both go half on the closing costs. If we double close it and whatever fee that you are negotiate would be, would be there. Um, on top of that, you may want to, you know, write up a, another agreement outside of that specifying how much money um, that is owed at closing to you or your company. Um, so there's no, you know, you're not looking for that wholesale to pay you your check you get your check right there at the closing table. Um, that's one way. Um, you can just, which I don't really recommend, and, and when it's too many wholesale deals in the middle where they, you know, you assign to this person and you that person signed it here and then you sign it to end buyer and now it's four transactions at the closing table, it just could get very messy. So what I like to do is just, if I know my wholesaler is wholesaling, I like to be honest with them and say, hey, I'm wholesaling it too. How much you want for it? I can, I can I can schedule it. I can structure it two ways. How much do you want? If I bring anything on top of it, it's mine. Or I can say, hey, um, how much you, you got it on the contract for? And whatever, I can go and, and find an in buyer uh, for, we could just go 50-50 on, in the, on the assignment fee. So that's kind of how I structure it uh, when I'm dealing with another wholesaler. Um, it's just coming together as one wholesaler. Um, but both of both of you get paid on on the HUD. All right, guys. And there you have it. I may have a different approach to that, though. Um, um, but yeah. Um, it, it, everything, first, first of all, everything's negotiable. Uh, it depends on what side of it you're on. Um, if you're on the seller side of it, meaning you have it under contract with the seller then you know you tend to have a little bit more control in my opinion because you actually have the deal um so the approach that i i would take that i take on that um i just tell them hey you bring me a deal with split it 50 50 bring me a buyer with 50 50 50 you know just mm -hmm. that cut and dry or whatever um if i'm on the uh, buyer side of it I, I really expect the same thing but they don't want to do it that way and they say hey this is my price whatever you make above that boom so it'll be up to me if I'm going to agree to that. But we, in any rate, I, I like to do purchase and sales agreements, joint, joint JV agreements. You get in a gray area then because you're not a real estate agent or whatever. But if I'm in the chain of command as far as the actual purchase and sales agreement, I'm insured to get paid, whether it's on the seller side or the buyer side. If I got my name on a contract with the seller or if I got my name on a contract with a buyer, um, the likelihood of me getting paid has increased tremendously. So, mm -hmm. um, but... You know, again, you know, it's up to you on how you want to go through. I'm just telling you that's how I'll get involved in those. So I want to be on the purchase and sales agreement, hopefully on both of them, but definitely on one of them. Okay. Um, did you mention about what? 100? No. Um, we still got to lock that in. Are we good to lock in the thing tonight? Um, yeah, uh, we good. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. All right, so um, we're going to, uh, it may not actually be number 100, but we're going to celebrate it as That's number 100. Can, can I do this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Not come right come close. Come close and talk to him. Oh, okay. Yay. Adrian's in the mic. Mm, mm, mm. Can y'all see me? Okay, so I haven't been mm -hmm. on in a while, but I have a fantastic announcement for you guys. To celebrate our 100th episode, well, episode Flip Bernard, we are going to do a live in-house events in Atlanta, Georgia on May 18th. Yes, May 18th. More details will come out. Um, there is limited seating. Um, so we will have like an RSVP seating uh, system going on. Just wanted to tell you guys that if you're near or can get to Atlanta on that day, go ahead and make reservations. Book that into your calendar. 
Um, Miss Renikia will be there. Ty, of course, mm -hmm. will be there. And so will I. We will do basically a live flip show. Um, there will be a moment for meet and greets. You can kind of network with other real estate investors. And I hope to see you there. But to yes. see the celebration of our 100th flipinar, there will be a live in-studio audience flip event May 18th in Atlanta, Georgia. And we will tell you the location, the exact place. Um, Maybe next week. Yeah, we'll have we'll have everything. Yeah. And place. we'll post it on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. So be on the lookout for that, guys. Yay! You got anything yes, else? Yes, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> Y'all gotta come out and show out. Y'all gotta come yeah, out and show up and show out. Guys. Guys. A success, you know? <laughs> anything else? No. You, you, you knocked out the park. I think so. Okay, so we're moving on up to the east side and moving out. This weather is getting bad. So anyone that's in the range of bad weather, take cover, be good. And mm -hmm. for any of those, happy Easter. We will see you all next week on Thursday. That's 6 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be here streaming live to answer your questions in regards to wholesaling, guys. We look forward to seeing mm -hmm. you next week. And also, don't forget to join the new Instagram group, Flipman IG. I'll see you on the flip side. Anything, boss? Yeah, flip man IG. Uh, Let's get him back to 20,000 followers <laughs> on Thursday oh, right now. Yeah, we yeah. need everybody to go and follow Flipman IG. All righty, guys. <laughs>